Hi, I'm Zachary Cowan, the author of the Study Daily Books, and thanks for joining me for a look at Doctrine and Covenants section 27. So it's been a couple of weeks since Emma's been baptized, but she hasn't yet been confirmed because of the persecution. So Sally Knight also hasn't been confirmed, and Joseph's decided, hey, let's go ahead and get them confirmed, members of the church, give them the gift of the Holy Ghost, and have a sacrament meeting. So Joseph's on his way to procure wine when an angel, a messenger from heaven, stops him and tells him some very interesting things about the sacrament. Go ahead and stop your video and look for what does the angel teach Joseph Smith that is and is not important when it comes to the sacrament in section 27, verses 1 through 4. All right, so what did you discover? What did the angel teach him is and is not important when it comes to partaking of the sacrament? For instance, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be wine. It can be water, and we know that in other cases it's been different things. But on some occasions, people even partook of 7-Up because the water was bad or wine was not available. And the angel goes ahead and says, hey, if you are going to have wine, make sure it's wine of your own make. Don't buy it from your enemies. I don't know that this meant that the saints always made their own wine, but they surely quit buying it from people that could tamper with it and different things like that. <clears throat> and the saints continue to partake of wine for the sacrament for a number of years. In fact, all the way up until like 1904, saints continue to use wine occasionally in sacrament. It doesn't matter so long as what's important is that we're doing this, eating it or drinking it in remembrance of the body and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's it. So maybe at this point we could ask this question. What do you do and what have been your habits to help you focus on the Savior during the sacrament? We've had a number of ideas suggested over the years and things that we've tried. One of the things that's helped me is to think of a different scripture story of the Savior. And it takes years to do this. If you're just taking one scriptural story that he had from the life of Jesus Christ, you can look up the harmony of the Gospels in the Bible Dictionary. And uh, it's just each little story of the Savior, if you just think about it as you partake of the sacrament, it takes you years to get through all of the events in his life. Or another thing is if you look up just Jesus Christ in the topical guide and you've got all of these different layers and subtitles and things for him, and you read a couple of scriptures on those and you're pondering on them. And when you go and you, you partake of the sacrament, you're thinking of that element of his life or his teachings. It can take years. And then his ministry with the Nephites, like there are so many ways to focus on Christ. There are people that read the hymns, the sacrament hymn, and pay attention to that and the verses that go along with that. Or they review their week, what they've done. Um, for you lately, has the sacrament been a thing that you partake of it and you're thinking of the future? Or are you thinking about the past, the things that the Savior has done for you, the things that he will do for you? Are you thinking about the wrongs that you've committed or how you're going to be better in the future? There's a lot of different ways to focus on the Savior and to approach this, which will allow us to have a better experience. My invitation would be what you already know, that this week or the next time you go and you have the opportunity to partake of the sacrament, that you do so focusing on the Savior. Even with my kids when they were younger, we would look at some of the scripture stories about the Savior or even just the pictures of the Savior and just talk about, all right, what do you love about the Savior in this picture as they were partaking of the sacrament? And it provided a powerful experience to help us really to heal, to help us really feel and learn of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded when one of my sons, Quinn, who's now 14 when he was a little boy, uh, we were in sacrament meeting and we're eating the sacrament. And we're having a great experience. And he goes, yeah. He looks over at me and he goes, Jesus is in my heart. I'm like, yes, he's getting it. And then he said, yeah, there's aliens in my body. And I thought, oh, no, I'm still failing as a parent. Lots of things to continue. It's a work in progress and we keep working on it. The next thing in this section that's really neat is in verses 5 through 13, you get this invitation that the Savior says, look, one day I'm going to come and I'm going to partake of the fruit of the vine again with you on the earth. We know that this is the meeting or one of the meetings that takes place in the, at Adam on Diamond, this invitation of a great sacrament meeting. Now notice that the Savior said, I'm not going to come partake of water. So don't be offended if when the Savior shows up, we drink a little wine. But he says, I'm going to come down and we are going to partake of the sacrament. And he gives you a guest list of all these other people who have significant keys 
that have been and played a role in the restoration who will also be there to make a reporting of their keys. And so in verses 5 through 13, mark the names, and then you can even see what role they played in the restoration. So go ahead, pause your video, check out verses 5 through 13, and check out this guest list of people who will be at the, the meeting at Adam and Diamond, turning over their priesthood keys, rendering an account to the Savior as he is coming down and partaking of the sacrament with those upon the earth. See you in a minute. Hey, thanks for studying. I hope you found a lot of things and had some questions, but every one of those people that he mentions at some point or another, they use those keys to help restore the gospel and to bring about blessings to us. There's a lot of questions about Elias and exactly who is Elias, and it depends on the context of who Elias is. Elias is one of these complicated things. So in verses 6 and 7, when it talks about an Elias, you get two different Eliases. You get an Elias that's restoring things in verse 6, and then you also learn that John the Baptist, like when he was born, his father Zacharias met the angel Gabriel, who was coming as an Elias. Well, Gabriel is Noah, and then John was going to function as Elias. So you have all these different things. If you will look up Elias in the Bible Dictionary, you'll see that there's four different things that people could re be referring to when they talk about Elias. And so in section 110, verse 12 of the Kirtland Dedication, when an Elias shows up, it's not the title of an Elias. He's not acting as Elias. Well, he kind of is acting Elias, but there's actually a person named Elias who restores the gospel of Abraham, which is this ability to have the Abrahamic covenant that is mentioned about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, even later on in section 27. Every one of these people are restoring something that allows us to make a covenant and a commitment and to receive blessings through the restoration of the gospel. And it's a marvelous thing. Just consider as you go through this list, how many covenants have you been able to make because these authorities were restored and you have received these promises now. It's marvelous. Here they are rendering account of what they've done to help restore the gospel. And one day we're gonna to get to render an account of what we've done with the things that they have restored. In fact, in verse 14, this might be an indication of how we get to participate in this meeting. This meeting isn't just for key holders. Look at verse 14. There might be one for key holders, and there may be more. And also with those whom my Father hath given me out of the world. He's not just coming to partake of the sacrament with these guys. There are many, many more that can come. Anybody that's been taken out of the world. Well, how in the world do you get taken out of the world? That's when you get these spectacular verses. Verses 15 through 18. How to put on the whole armor of God. So go ahead, pause your video again. Study verses 15 through 18. You know these verses. You love these verses. Go see what insights you have about how to put on the whole armor of God. What is God giving us to help us protect different aspects of our life so that we can come out of the world and be ready to partake of the sacrament meeting with the Savior? All right, see you in a minute. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a good study. We know that there's various parts of the body that are protected, like our head. It talks about our goals, like what are our thoughts and how are they going? Our feet represent our goals and the direction our life is going, our heart, our chest, which represents like our feelings and our most desires, and also our loins, which talks about the sexual reproductive organs and that those things are protected by truth and different things and all these things that come and protect us. And I bet you have incredible ideas and that there's this shield of faith, and then as we take on faith, it can take in adversity that comes to us in this sword of truth. I have just one other thought. In all the things that you've read on this, I think the context of section 27 is really important. That if you wanna know, how do you put on this breastplate, and how do you put on the helmet, and how do you put on faith, and how do you take up the sword of truth, that one of the things that we can really do to protect us and put on the whole armor of God is to faithfully partake of the sacrament each when we have an opportunity to do that. That's the context of section 27. And the Lord tells Joseph like, look, if you wanna be a part of the sacrament meeting with the Savior, how do you do it? You partake of the sacrament. You think of Jesus Christ. You make covenants to act like him. And that is putting on the whole armor of God. To put on the armor of God is to act more like Jesus Christ. To be able to approach things the way that he would do it to protect our thoughts, our desires, our goals, our ability to engage in love, 
to take up faith, how we're going to treat the word and how we're going to use it to defend us and protect us. And it allows us to do this. So enjoy the sacrament this week as it helps you put on the whole armor of God and prepare for a time where you can sit down with the Savior and think of him as you partake of the sacrament as he administers it. May we not have to wait. Let's go partake of it and have that experience now. All right, thanks for studying. We'll see you next time.